In the meantime, um, those who have who have joined on time, if you would like to state your name, uh, affiliation, and maybe a little bit about your work or a link to your to your website or an article about your work, please feel free to do so in the chat. Okay, why don't we get started. Um, so again, thank you everyone for joining our event today, which is a precursory event in anticipation of the upcoming Open Government Digital Youth Summit on October 27th and 28th. Um, but for this event, um, it's going to be a fireside chat between Glynis Cummings-John and Renata Lille who will be discussing their unique yet ultimately connected experiences working with youth in Brazil and Sierra Leone. Um, they'll also be talking about their experiences working with the Open Government Partnership locally and globally. Uh, but before we get to that conversation, I want to share a couple of housekeeping points. Um, throughout the uh, call, please keep your, mu your, mic, your mic muted. Um, and if you have any questions, please share them in the chat and our speakers will get to them at the end of their initial conversation. Um, that said, uh, it is now my absolute pleasure to introduce our speakers. First, we have Hinata Leo. Um, she majored in public administration and is passionate about public policy. Last year, she worked for five months as a uh, open government agent in the city of Sao Paulo, Brazil. She currently integrates the labor market and employability department in an educational organization. Um, she is also the head of research at Youth Voices, Voices Bra Brazil and is a founding member of the OpenGov Youth Collective. Um, in, in, uh, in addition to Hinata, we also have uh, Glennis Cummings-John joining us. She is the Deputy Country Director at Restless Development Sierra Leone and is an outgoing Open Government Partnership Steering Committee member. <clears throat> she holds a Bachelor's in International Relations and Politics as well as a Master's in Children, Youth and International Development. She's also the founder of She Can, We Can, an organization equipping young, innovative women for leadership across Africa. So that all that said, and um, they'll be talking a lot more about their experiences, but hey, Nasser Glynis, would either of you like to start us off discussing your individual experiences with open government and youth? Thank you, Katie. Um, I, I believe I can start, Glynis, and then yeah, I go to you afterwards. Um, so, okay, our main topic of discussion here will be um, um, civic space and public participation and how we can include youth in this. I just wanna make one first disclaimer that English is not my first language. So I um, apologize in advance if I get anything wrong. Um, okay, now we can go on. Um, so I want to start talking about my experience being a open government agent here in Sao Paulo. And I think it's important to tell you what this um, open government agent um, program is here. What, what the, why the municipality created this, this program. So it's a program that aims in free training and certification to the population in a lot of different regions of Sao Paulo. So um, the main idea is to decentralize the training agenda about open government. Um, Sao Paulo is a municipality with um, 12 million people. So, and, and most of times all of these courses and trainings and cultural events, they, they are located in the central area of the city and it leaves behind a lot of people that lives in the, um, the more distant neighborhoods. So this program, um, they um, give grants for individuals like me that in some way can teach 
um, um, topics related to open government to all the population. And the requirements is that we go to all the neighborhoods in Sao Paulo, so not just the the main and the the main central areas here. So. Um, this was a, a, a very nice experience for me because I think I, I learned so much getting out of my neighborhood and getting out of my comfort zone, I, I would say. Um, getting out of my bubble here where, um, I mean, my university bubble where we always discuss open government and public policy. So it was very important for me to go to this different neighborhood. And um, my workshop, the workshop that I developed, was called One City, Different Lenses. So how can we use open government and co-creation to make Sao Paulo a better city for everyone? And so in the topics of open government, I, um, I focused in participation, inclusion, and diversity. Um, that, I mean, so we always, uh, I remember when we went to Canada last year, the open, the youth open, uh, the open government youth collective, we would discuss a lot how the open government um, term is so broad, sometimes it's difficult to understand what it is. And I would start my, my workshop asking people what do they think open government means? And then I would give them sticky notes. And these are the sticky notes from the real um, workshop I gave last year. Um, and they would just write everything that would come to their head. And with this sticky notes, I got, I made a word cloud. I'm not sure if I can show here, Katie, like show my screen. I think I can, uh, let me sh share. It's in Portuguese. I don't know if you can see it, but I digitalized it yesterday, actually. But I got here in Portuguese, we have participation, transparency, society, government, also democracy, inclusion, openness. So it's actually everything that we really talk about uh, when we talk about um, open government. Um, so going back a little bit to the things that I wanted to focus, that was um, participation, inclusion, and diversity. Uh, my main goal was to um, engage people in working their empathy um, with the main goal of uh, when, when, you, when you work your empathy, you um, work participation because it's impossible for us to put people to discuss ideas and participate in government if you cannot hear other people's opinion. Um, so I used um, a tool that, that I learned there in Canada in our um, OGP summit. So in Canada, they have the GBA plus, the gender-based Analy analysis plus, and I made like a Portuguese version of it. So it's like a GBA um, identity analysis that I thought it would be so nice to bring because it's great to show the in, uh, intersectionalities of the identities. And I thought it would be great for people to start thinking about um, inclusion and about how and about how other people experience public policies. It's like the first step for us to work with empathy. Um, okay, and this is like a very rich tool to, for us to create participation and to um, create a open civic space, a democratic environment, and that's how we, we work with open government. And, and I want to talk about one, um, challenging um, challenging uh, workshop I had here in Sao Paulo. And that's how I think it's, um, we can um, keep the discussion because when we, when we talk about, um, 
So all these identities and participation, it looks like such an obvious theme that we need to be empath empathetic with people and we need to include everyone. But at least here in Brazil, um, nowadays, we are living in a very por polarized um, political um, scenario that talk about this simple issue that we believe it's simple. It, when I when I got to the field and I when I said that I got out of my comfort zone, I saw that it, it was not very simple to talk about it. Um, just to have the word gender in this um, in this tool here, the the GBA plus gender based analysis plus would make me feel very uncomfortable in some places. Um, because in some places, in some neighborhoods that I went, people would think that talk about gender is wrong, that we shouldn't be talking about gender in like public spaces. It's something you should just talk in, in your family or in your private, um, in your private life. So it, it was very challenging for me. And, um, even like some government people during my workshops, they would come and say, oh, you shouldn't be talking about this. This is something like people should talk in, in like their private life. Uh, but how can we have a democratic space? How can we have an open government if we don't include all these identities and if we don't talk about gender? So uh, I, and then that's how I, I get to and how we can create um, more um, welcoming space and how can we can create um, a safe space to discuss this kind of topic. Um, and I think this is where the empathy exercises come in. Um, I think when we do this empathy um, dynamics, it's the perfect, w perfect way for us to start thinking about um, inclusion and diversity. So um, and what, why um, talking about empathy has to do with open government? Um, why, uh, um, why, uh, because then you, you start putting yourself in other people's shoes. You start looking to things in different lenses. And this is important to you that was participating in the workshop, but this was also very important to those public servants that at first were very closed about talking about these topics. But after we started some exercises, they were a little bit more open. And I started to focus in not anymore in using those terms like gender, like sexual orientation, but instead of that, I would make this um, Empath empathy exercises with people. So this is my like broad experience. It was very, very challenging. And I also have um, something to talk about um, data and pandemic in Brazil, but now I'm gonna give it to Glynis and then we can discuss it better um, afterwards, okay? Sorry, I was on mute. Um, so my experience, my technical area of experience is in inclusion um, and of course, trying to work with different governments to help them to improve their governance mechanisms, uh, accountability pathways, uh, and how they can include people of all, of all voices, genders and abilities in their decision-making processes. So um, I have uh, authored Sierra Leone's first national aging policy um, and also worked very closely with other governments across Africa in terms of how they can design um, inclusive legislation, but also deliver inclusive initiatives. Um, and I'm really keen to see how we can generate uh, a discussion here today um, that has a role for everyone, um, because we all have something meaningful to contribute. Um, so I, on that, uh, I think I want to go in a bit about what's really happening here in, in Sierra Leone, uh, which is the country that I'm based in. Um, so I work for Restless Development and I'm based in Sierra Leone. 
And Sierra Leone has really been on a journey in regards to um, open governance, uh, co-creation, uh, and how the civic space operates. And I would say that from the time leading up to the Civil War, um, young people were definitely overlooked. Young people were definitely not considered as a group to go to for uh, advice, consultation, information on good governance. Um, and to a certain extent, that contributed towards young people feeling like the only way they can get their opinion across is by um, resulting to violence. And as many of you know, many of the soldiers were young people and were children as well. So we got through the war, a decade long war, we got through the war and a lot of stakeholders finally started to realize that actually we need to engage these young people in a very meaningful way. Uh, fast forward to, to now where we have the Youth Bulge, um, which is not just unique to Sierra Leone, but pretty much across entire Africa where 50% of the population are considered to be young people. Yet um, there is this kind of challenge of how to effectively engage these young people so that we do not put uh, our society at risk um, of people being frustrated, young people feeling like they're left out, not being included in governance, decision-making processes, um, is definitely a risk that I believe stakeholders are aware of. Um, so there's that factor. There's the awareness now that indeed young people need to be engaged in a positive way. But fast for, um, taking a step back to Ebola, Sierra Leone, um, along with Liberia and Guinea, they experienced um, the Ebola virus. And um, there was a lot of dissatisfaction from the general public about how funds were spent, accountability of funds, a lot of funds, you know, went missing and no one really knew where it was spent. And with extremely high levels of poverty in the country, there was a lot of frustration. We are now in another pandemic, which is the coronavirus, um, the COVID-19 pandemic. And because of the things that Sierra Leone has experienced, um, because of the youth bulge in Sierra Leone, there has been a lot of pressure and demand from young people on stakeholders, civil society and government uh, representatives to be accountable for the decisions that they're making. Um, I know that this is not the same in other countries, but because of what Sierra Leoneans experienced through the Ebola crisis, we are definitely in a different place where people feel a lot more confident to say, we know money has come in, we don't know where it's gone. We want to know where it's gone. We want to know what services are available to us. We want to know how we can hold you accountable. Um, and as a result of that, civil society and government stakeholders have actually come together um, and they are co-creating um, and they are designing things together. They are getting messages out there. Um, a lot of people don't realize or a lot of people underestimate how many people are online how many people are on, involved in the digital space, even in a country as poor as Sierra Leone? Almost everyone has WhatsApp here. So many people have a smartphone. Yes, they might not have a car, but they will have a basic smartphone. Press releases are shared uh, via WhatsApp, via Facebook from the, the State House. Um, there is this pressure to keep people informed because of what happened during the Ebola crisis. And there is that demand coming from young people, moving young people into a space of power. Um, and I know that, uh, I think that that is significant and that's a lesson that perhaps could be carried to other places, other countries where I know that, um, for instance, in the UK, there is this expectation, just automatic expectation that the government will just tell the, the, uh, everyone exactly what they need to know. And that has not always been the case throughout this pandemic. But in Sierra Leone, people have actually demanded for information at the village level all the way to the capital city level. And I think that that is a fantastic learning taken from the Ebola crisis, but it's also something that takes, uh, continues to push Sierra Leone on this journey about youth engagement um, in open governance, not just in a pandemic, but also in a uh, development context in, in normal everyday life. Um, so I will stop there and let you, you come in, uh, Renetta. I have a lot more to share about what Restless Development is doing and some key examples of young people, but I'll let you come in with anything you want to add at this point. Thank you, Glynis. 
Yes, I think it's it's now the time to talk also about data and the pandemic here in Brazil. Um, so here we are going to also a very sensitive um, period concerning data. Um, during the start of pande the pandemic here, the government, the national government, the federal government stopped um, stopped sharing the um, accumulated number of deaths. So they would share it in a very difficult way of people to understand what was actually happening concerning infections and deaths. Um, and people also started to demand the a more um, understanding understandable data because um, they would the, they would what they was what they were um, putting um, in a public way was very difficult to understand um, so and, and once uh, uh, so what uh, what else happened was that um, the government put data in a, and they made the sum wrong so the state here in Brazil, the states are the um, responsible to um, giving the data to the federal government. And in one week, the federal government made like the count, the sum wrong. And this made, uh, and this created a very um, um, weird scenario. So how is the federal government um, giving us the wrong data about the pandemic death? And this made people start start to um, demand for a more accountable um, scenario for the pandemic data. So what happened here is that um, we wouldn't believe in anything else the federal government would put to us. So here in Brazil now, the the media, the the big media um, vehicles, they made this consortium. And every day, all of, of these different media vehicles, they go to the um, they go to the state government. They get this data, and they themselves make all of this um, all of this sums. And they uh, that's what we have um, every day in terms of um, the pandemic deaths and the pandemic infections, because we wouldn't anymore believe and what the federal government would put in public. So that's how, that's the solution we got for now. But this is so sad because if we cannot um, believe in the data our federal government put up there, um, who are we going to believe? And I, I'm, I'm happy we still have a, a, a big and free um, press here in Brazil. Um, and that's what, uh, and they they are the main actors now. They are the main stakeholders that are holding the population accountable about um, the pandemic situation here. Um, also, the pandemic put into um, um, into our eyes some other um, open government issues and corruption issues here. So we had some um, issues concerning um, public um, procurement. So they would buy, uh, they, uh, the government had to buy a lot of health, um, health stuff right now to, um, to the hospitals here. And we discovered that there was a lot of co corruption going on. And this is all about open government. I mean, for, uh, I started talking about participation and empathy that for me, it's like this, this side of open government. But now when we talk about um, open data and holding people accountable, it's something that we should demand from our, our government. And of course, it's, it's great that we have a free press and a media that can do all this work, but this should, ha this should have been be done for, uh, for our federal government. Um, so yes, this is the situation here in Brazil, and I think youth has a, a big power in demanding this information. Um, and yeah, that's it for now. Um, Julianis and Kate. So for Sierra Leone, um, 
we have, like I said, we have the youth vote, and it's absolutely key that the youth demand for accountability and transparency in this COVID response uh, and recovery phase that we're, we're moving into. Because if we don't, you know, what are young people going to have to work with uh, tomorrow? Um, so I think it's, it's, it's fantastic that we have such a demand and that we've moved on from the lessons learned from Ebola. Um, and I think it's, it's really good that the government are open to listening to the feedback, listening to the ideas of civil society and young people. For instance, uh, when the government wanted to put together its recovery plan, it called on civil society to a meeting to say, what should we do? What measures do we need to put in place? We have regular meetings with government officials about messaging that should go out to the general public. And we together design the messaging and we agree on what works. We also have very low literacy. 75% of the population cannot read or write. So they understand that it's civil society who are the foot soldiers on, at the local level who can actually go out there with young people to get the messages across to community members. So they know that in order for this um, to, to be a, a manageable response for them, they need to work with young people, they need to work with civil society who know exactly what's going on uh, at the community level. A couple of examples of what Restless Development are doing in that area. Uh, of course, Restless Development is a youth-led organization powered by young people. The majority of our staff are, are young people themselves and um, we have young people uh, working with the government um, to sensitize the general public. We've reached um, just over 300,000 people across Sierra Leone, um, sharing messages about wearing a mask, washing your hands, uh, social distancing, preventative measures, what to do if you notice signs and symptoms, um, and taking it to you know, the really basic level so people can grasp it. Because during Ebola, a lot of people didn't believe that it was real, so they carried on doing everything they were doing, which helped with the spread. So the government recognizes the role of civil society, but also the significance in the peer-to-peer -peer approach, young people to young people. If you have a majority population of young people and you don't involve another young person talking to that young person, the message might not get across. Um, so that has been working quite well with Restless Development. Um, Restless has also, through, through young people, been working with the Anti-Corruption Commission to help them track when the money's coming in, where is it going? sharing information um, in a very local level, a low literacy level with the general public to help them to understand X amount of money has come in, this is where it's going, this is what it means in regards to what services you can access and what, um, who you can hold accountable and when. Um, here in Sierra Leone, you have a lot of people um, keeping an eye on things through social media, through uh, digital platforms. You have photos of things. If, if procurement processes have taken place, that information will be shared on WhatsApp and the general public will, public will know within 24 hours. Um, if assets have been brought in, we will see it uh, and people will have questions. Uh, so the government are really aware that all, a lot of eyes are on them and they're really trying to see how they can engage as many um, stakeholders general public members as possible to help them achieve um, and, man and manage this, this uh, process as, as well as possible. Um, Restless Development through another program has also been working with the government to maintain its reduction in teenage pregnancy strategy. Um, of course, uh, some of you may know that during crises such as this, you will usually see a, a spike in teenage pregnancy. You usually see an increase because People are not in school, they're not in education, they're not engaged in their usual activities. So you tend to see a spike in teenage pregnancy. The government recognizes again, the role of young people, the role of civil society, and so has reached out to Restless Development to support them in sharing, um, in delivering initiatives and sharing messages. Uh, and we've really seen great progress in, in that in regards to, uh, in comparison to the Ebola crisis as well. So I think that, I won't go into, I won't share a shopping list of all the things that we're doing, but there is, in Sierra Leone, there's definitely a lot of lessons learned. Um, and I think that these are things that can be applied to other countries, not just in Africa, but, you know, beyond Africa. I don't think that we have, we don't have to wait for, I mean, Sierra Leone went through the Ebola crisis and then learned the lessons and is now applying them to this. But I think that we can apply them to this 
crisis right now. We don't need to wait until the end of this crisis before we take a step back and reflect on the significance of the role of young people um, and uh, the importance of civic space and co-creation. Um, I would say that there, it's important for um, stakeholders to recognize what we have to offer as young people, but it's also, I think, important for young people to recognize the, um, the value in them being willing to volunteer. Um, a stakeholder may say, or a government representative may say, I don't have a contract, I can't afford to pay you, but I would love to have you as a volunteer attending our meetings all the time to share your view of what's happening where you live. I think we need to be, we need to be ready to volunteer in that capacity so we can meaningfully contribute to co-creation, can meaningfully contribute to decision-making processes as young people. Sometimes there won't always be a salary or a job title um, attached to it. Uh, and that's definitely part of the restless model where we engage so many young people and get their foot into the sector through volunteerism. I also think that um, for young people, I think we always we also need to consider how we are communicating our added value and what we have to offer, um, and uh, ensuring that the right message uh, hits those people and that they don't just see a lot of noise or um, uh, a lot of distractions, but they're actually hearing that we do have the technical know-how, uh, we are speaking from experience. We are, um, we, we can be a voice for other people in the community uh, and we can add value to their conversations and decisions that they're making. I think that, um, you know, this is another way for young people to get involved um, in, in open, open governance processes, be it during COVID and even after COVID. Um, the other point uh, I was going to make, which has slipped my mind, um, which is about um, um, yeah, working with stakeholders to kind of set up long-standing um, uh, platforms to show them that actually, yes, we can organize ourselves in a, 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 as a collective. Um, we can bring something together as a collective. And um, you know, I'm not just a minority in this as a young person, but there are more of us. Um, so that this is something that stands the test of time. Um, so that even five years from now, there is a platform that different stakeholders who've been elected can, can connect with and link back to. Great. I think I can um, now I also um, give my ideas on how can you get more involved um, as part of the solution and how can we use our youth power as part of this solution to all these many challenges that me and Glynis just talked about. Um, so I believe um, here in Brazil, one of our biggest challenges are is um, the polarized political environment. Um, in terms of the pandemic, there's a lot of denials um, so a lot of our politicians just deny that we have a, a, a serious health issue go, going on. Um, so yes, here we also use a lot of WhatsApp, we share a lot of information, but sometimes we share fake news and fake information. So how can we also be very aware of this and just don't share um, anything that you receive in your WhatsApp that maybe that sometimes are not true. So this, I think it's something you um, and everyone, but um, we, we should be very, we, we should pay a lot of attention on. So everything I receive on my WhatsApp, everything I read, I should check the sources. Um, and not just youth, but I, 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 sometimes I tell my grandma send me WhatsApp messages with like, crazy news and I have to have a lot of empathy again with her. She comes from a, a different place, that, place than where I come from. She doesn't have all this in, access to internet and information. So I have to go in a very nice way and tell my grandma that, are you sure this is, this is true? Let, let us see um, the source, where, where this comes from. So 
so then um, she won't share it with all of her friends and all of her people, all of her friends, and um, uh, and and share all of this fake news uh, about the pandemic. And also, one thing that Glennis said that I I really agree with is that um, youth can should be um, we should start um, to believe in ourselves and get into these power spaces and sometimes volunteering is a way we can do this so sometimes the government won't hire me to be there but there's a lot of other ways i can start getting get into those power spaces and start to actually shift the power so how can we put our voices heard there and and then i also made a list of things that i think i think it's very important for youth to do so first we should um uh, start exercising our empathy and seek to um people to exercise their empathy so you should carry like this framework everywhere you go so when people talk about um all of the identities you say yeah but maybe what about this intersection of identity so you should um make people start to think about it to think about this um empathy exercises in everything they do in their lives in their work in their per personal um, life and that's how people will start reviewing their biases and how, that's how people will start um thinking about other people and make their environment more democratic and and make and this is all about participation and about open government and also um we should seek to elect people who respect different identities i know this this seems like obvious but it's not so obvious again um because the the government um we should elect governments that will be open for participation of all, um, that will be open for uh, a democratic government beyond the day of the election. So we should elect people that will not think about the full result of that day and people who afterwards will be open for all of the, the population, um, considering all the social minorities and demands from all the people. So this is what uh, we should um, hold the government accountable. Um, that's my that, that's my main um, advice here for people. So put yourself in power um, in the in where the power is. Um, believe in yourself and always exercise your empathy. Katie, now you can go. I almost hate to interrupt such an incredible conversation between the two of you. Um, it's so interesting to see how um, inclusion is obviously a very important part of both of your work and, and how you've been um, uh, focusing on that, whether it's personally, Hinata, as you say, through showing empathy or making sure that um, youth voices are being heard in Sierra Leone. I guess I kind of want to push back a little bit on a certain idea um, of volunteerism. And so I, I want I want to hear from you two about the potential pitfalls of requiring volunteerism to enter a space, especially considering um, either non-college educated or people from low income communities um, or people from communities who wouldn't even know to join a call like this. Um, I Like when we think about inclusion, we of course, and I know you two have much, probably have a lot of ideas on this is, um, if I'm a young person who is just working to pay my bills and try to get this done, um, and I perhaps I do manual labor and I'm very tired at the end of the day, is it fair to ask of me to be at the mayor's office um, every Sunday evening or something like that uh, to give my opinions? And, and is that potentially extractive? Um, and how can governments, if this is if this is just how it needs to work at first, um, how can governments, whether local or or national or federal, um, how can they make sure that this this process is truly inclusive um, of of um, 
young people from various demographic groups instead of kind of the the typical um the typical young people who may be interested in in this would love to hear your guys's thoughts okay sorry just unmuting myself um so um volunteerism is not the only way but it is a option a option some people are able to get their foot in the door quite quickly uh, for others, not so easy. Uh, I'll speak. I'll speak for myself. Um, number one, I'm a young person. Number two, I'm black. Number three, I'm a woman. Uh, these are um, these are three areas that have um, been barriers to me really in trying to access certain spaces um, for as long as I can remember. Uh, and so I've been very adaptable in my approach to trying to achieve what I want to achieve. If I can't access what into the space I want to access into uh, in option A, I will try option B. If option B doesn't work, I'll try option C. That doesn't mean that what I have to add is of lesser value. Um, I, I remember when I finished my degree, I thought that because I had a degree, I would actually be able to get like a manager position instantly because I had a degree. Um, no one told me that I had to back up the theory with practical. I didn't have any experience, I just had my degree. So I actually was job hunting for an entire year um, until eventually I met someone who offered me a volunteering opportunity and I jumped at it. I, some may see it as being extractive because they were getting ideas and input from me, but I was also gaining so much from that experience. Um, and I was able to contribute towards the strategic direction of that organization as a volunteer. Um, and I personally gained a lot um, from that organization. Um, just as a volunteer, I was able to get my foot in the door. I had exposure to different stakeholders. I was able to contribute to the, the strategic direction. Um, and I did it for a set period of time. Uh, and sometimes that's the only way for some people Sometimes that's not the only way, but I think it's important to recognize that we should be open to different avenues to achieving what we want to achieve and that one, one size might not fit all. Great. I, I agree with you, Glynis. And Katie, it's such an important question, this one you made. Um, I think it's very, when we, we talk about um, um, volunteering, we uh, we can leave behind people that are that that need to fight for your everyday food. You need to be working to eat today. So I think when we talk about um, youth that have the time and the privilege to give this little time of your week to be volunteering, we are already getting getting a privileged youth. Um, and and of course, but but of course, we shouldn't just like make this solution not um, not okay because of that. As Lynn said, I I think there's a lot of facts, but we should look at this in a critical way, and that's I think what you brought here, Katie. Um, and and then I think there there are some solutions we should also demand our governments and our organizations overall to start looking at um, the program um, the open government agent that I was part of is a program that they actually give us give individuals small grants so all of these workshops I made it, it was not a volunteer work I actually got paid with a small grant but I think this is for me this, this is the perfect solution so the youth and individuals overall, they can start um, getting more pra practical. They start to have practical experiences, but they get paid even if it's a little bit for doing this job. Um, also, uh, when we discuss internships, um, so it's a very important uh, first step for you in your career, but there are a lot of internships that don't pay anything. And again, for some people, it makes a lot of sense for people that have a stable life, that you have like your house, you don't have kids. But for youth here in Brazil, I, I work with youth that 
um, um, teenage girls that have kids already and they need to work to feed their kids and they, they need to work and they need to get money. So they, they cannot volunteer and they cannot um, go into unpaid internships. So how can we address, I mean, we can still have unpaid internships, but how can we address all of these different people? And that's how, again, I get this again. So we have, again, like, um, yeah, I have, like, people that have a good income and they, that can get into unpaid internships, but I also have people with low income, people that have kids, people that go through a lot of, um, a lot of struggle and that cannot put yourself into this um, situation. So there's I think one this, I there's one thing I you can go on. Thank you, which is that um, even on a local level, um, volunteerism uh, in a space where there's decisions being made doesn't necessarily mean in Parliament that you, you're all working for an MP or something like that. It could be as a young woman in your community um, volunteering to be the youth representative or to be the women's representative when the chief meets with his community leaders, you perhaps maybe have volunteered yourself to represent a group of people who live in that community and contribute to decisions being made as a representative. Um, in that capacity, you might not be paid, but you have access to power and shaping what is happening in that community, that village, or that town that you might be living in. So that's like another example of something that might not take up everyone's um, entire week but it's like a, an opportunity for them to have access to power to influence and to bring in that youth voice um, at a local level um, as well so it can work on various levels but it's just about being open to different opportunities that present themselves to us as young people Thank you both for um, being willing to to uh, bring your thoughts on, on this topic. I just I thought it would be important, and I, and I think you both brought up um, great points that this is one of one is what needs to be one of many avenues to reach out to young people and and people of um, various marginalized uh, demographic groups. Um, and so I, I think you guys brought up really good points. I just want to make sure that we um, recognize the the difficulties and the the challenges that some people might face when when trying to pursue that avenue in particular. Um, so kind of going off of that, I would love to hear. Um, it, it can be very brief. It can be um, a little bit have more examples through your own work or what you've seen in your various localities. But um, okay, I'm a young person. I'm listening to you guys. I'm inspired. I have no idea where to start. What do I do? Do I contact my mayor's office? Do I like look up OGP, the OGP um, point of contact for the country and send an email introducing myself? What do I do? How do I, how do I become the youth advisor for wherever I may live, or how, how do I learn about what opportunities that perhaps that governments are also offering? Is that just a Google thing? Do I join a mailing list? Um, if you guys could just throw out some ideas for perhaps uh, some of the young people who are really inspired by the work that you guys have been doing, but don't necessarily know where to start. Okay, uh, I'm happy to start. Basically, everything you just said, Katie, but before that step, I think it's really important to um, recognize that we have to think about what we have to offer. Uh, as an individual, what do we have to offer? Um, and what do we want to say that we can outsource as expertise or as knowledge or experience? Or what's the plan you want to show um, whoever it is that you're going to contact so that they can see what it is that you're contributing and why they need you in that room, why you need to be at that table. Um, I think sometimes we as young people say, we need to be in the room, but then we don't communicate the rest of the sentence, which is about why we need to be in that room. Um, and I think it's important to get that together, to have that clear in our minds as individuals and as a collective, think about, okay, what am I bringing to this and what do I want to achieve and how am I gonna help them also achieve open governance, good governance, uh, inclusion, um, and, and then it's about how do I package that information? How do I get that information? How do I get that message across in the most effective way where it will result in action? 
think um, it's very easy to rush into things. It's very easy to say, I want to have a meeting. And when you have a meeting, you haven't really thought through what you want to say. And then maybe after the meeting, you realize, oh, maybe I should have said this and I should have said that. Um, it's, you can't underestimate the importance of, of preparing before you reach out to uh, OGP, your local representative, your local mayor, your local chief. Um, in Sierra Leone, Restless Development helped to set up district youth councils where we have young people serving on the local council, um, advising um, the, the local councillor and the mayor about what they should be doing in that district. So the districts are kind of like um, uh, cities. Um, so we have set up that platform, but those young people to get into that space have to know what they have to offer and why um, nobody should question why they're in that space. Great. I also believe how um, the, pra the practical activities are so important to you. So that's what Katie said, that you should, it, everything that Katie and Lydia said, I also agree, you should go and um, first, well, uh, I think recognizing what bothers you the most. So what will be your calls, your main calls, it's a good start. So then you know, um, where you can start looking at. Um, so here in Brazil, I'm, I represent Youth Voices Brazil and we work mostly with youth employment and labor market for youth here. So if this is something that bothers you about that you want to work on, it's a great um, organization for you to start if you're from Brazil. But um, all the other issues that you you are uh, that you work on or you are concerned about, um, it, identifying this issue is the first step for you to know where you can act. Which of the uh, government people should you go to? Which of the NGOs can you look to um, and start volunteering or to apply for a job? And also, I think it's so important for us you start going to those places because it's very important to start being the example, being a reference for other young people. Um, so working in Youth Voices Brazil, um, I'm one of the leadership of the group and I feel that sometimes when we start, start putting um, other members into like the highlights, Sometimes they don't believe in themselves so much. They ask me, oh, Renata, am I the right person to talk in this webinar? And I say, of course you are. So, I mean, um, where I want to get into is that the most youth we have out there, the more we will get other youth inspired and the more youth people will believe they can do it and they can be heard and they can be a part of it. So I think this is like, go on and put your, put your, uh, get your voice to be heard and that's how you're going to inspire another youth. Thank you both. Um, before, uh, I will need a couple minutes at the end um, to just close up, but one question we received um, from Amninata uh, is, uh, actually to Hinata, um, could you go a little bit more into how your, your prioritization of empathy um, has, has been, been, perhaps been unique or been a help of your work um, and, and in particular for inclusiveness? Um, you did mention a, a couple of examples and, and whatnot, but it would be great. I think it would be a nice note, a nice positive note in, in a, during a pandemic um, and during all the tough times that, are, that people are experiencing is how, how, can, how can empathy help our work, especially when it comes to inclusion? Oh, great question. Um, I believe it, were, it, it helps a lot because I believe it's the first step of inclusion and it's the first step to participation because we, we cannot create a discussion group, a participation group in any part of government or society if people don't have the empathy and the respect 
to listen to another to other opinions and just respect it. So we need this from society and from government. And I think it's something that it's not simple at all. Um, that's why I mentioned the exercises I made with the, in, in the workshop. And one of the exercises I actually learned again from the GBA um, policy in Canada. It's like a framework you have, and then you have a lot of columns and um, lines. And so you need to write, so you have there like people in my work, people in my family, people in my um, school, my university. And then here you have those identities that you have here in the framework. So you need to write like in my work, all the people are um, cisgender or transgender. In my work, the people are black or the people are white. And in most of cases, you end up the exercise learning that you are in a very, um, how, can I, how can I put it, in a very similar environment and you don't live with different people. And for me, this, and then people realize by themselves. So it's not something that I'm telling you like, oh, so you just leave, you just work with white people. That's why you don't think about racial policy. The, peop the person when you, um, when you feel this exercise, these people made the conclusion by the themselves. And this was such a, a, a nice first step for people working with empathy and starting to um, break and revising their biases. I think it's enough, uh, but we can talk later um, about this topic, I will be happy to share more more insight. Thank you so much, Anasta. Um, yeah, I think it, leading people to come to their own conclusions um, a lot of time is more, as you mentioned, is more convincing um, than telling them from the offset, especially if it's in a confrontational manner. So um, great, great lesson to end on. Um, so um, I want to first thank Hinata and Glynis uh, so much for their time today. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to learn from you both and also celebrate the work that you are doing to bring youth voices to the forefront of open government movements in your countries and beyond. Um, I'd also like to thank the Open Government Partnership Communications team for working with us to make this event and, and the ones following happen. Um, so for the folks who, who joined in this conversation, it was great to have you and I have some good news. Um, this event is actually part of a series of pre-summit events that we are hosting this month. So next week we are going to be chatting with Blair Glencourse, the uh, Executive Director of Accountability Lab and one of the newest members of the OGP Steering Committee, um, as well as Shaimei Burji, uh, another founding member like Hinata of the OpenGov Youth Collective. And they're going to talk about the creation and work of the collective itself, as well as the upcoming OpenGov Digital Youth Summit. Um, so so uh, to register for the summit itself, let me put this link in the chat. Sorry. There we go. So um, here's the here's the link for registration. But um, and and feel free to to visit our landing page at the Accountability Labs website. Um, we are going to have over 20 sessions on public participation in civic space, as well as anti-corruption and digital inclusion. And we're going to bring all these ideas together um, so that we can work towards ensuring a youth accountable and inclusive pandemic response and recovery around. The the world. Um, if you'd like to share the summit with your youth networks or, or other people you think might be interested, um, please check out the Accountability Lab, Restless Development, and Open Government Partnership social media accounts for more information and posts to share. Um, that's all for me today. So on behalf of Accountability Lab and Restless Development, as well as the OpenGov Youth Collective, I want to say thank you again for joining us and we hope to see you at the summit. Thank you, Katie, and thank you, everyone. See you at the summit. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Take care. See you at the summit.
Bye, everyone.